everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, is this working? On the back? Okay, great. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, sort of some broad ideas, but really the work that I'm talking about for my own group is being led by uh, my postdoc, Phil Thomas, and uh, my grad student, Travis Mendel. So I think that when we talk about safety and control, it's um, tempting to sometimes slip into our technical view of knowing what these things mean. But when we start to think about talking the, uh, about these ideas to the public, these are very high value and emotional words. And so to me, I think perhaps it's more fruitful to think about talking about understanding complex systems and understanding AI systems in the way that we've been starting to talk about things like interpretability. Um, and I think when we start to talk about understanding the systems and the decisions they make, then both it sounds a little bit less scary, and it also opens up the potential for many more applications um, that are not perhaps being currently addressed by AI because people are concerned about these other form of words. So in particular, in my own work, I'm really interested in creating AI systems to interact with stochastic, uncertain worlds, um, in particular, people. So when we start to think about sort of having an intelligent agent that it can interact with a person, it's really hard to model people. I think personally a lot about making intelligent agents that interact in an education setting, and it's very hard to model student learning. And yet we think that there's huge potential to be able to have AI systems that can help people better learn, help people get better medical treatment, and even in the context of things like consumer relationship management. And so one popular for, uh, framework for doing this is known as reinforcement learning, and I think there's been some discussion of that, and certainly Tom and Claire are experts in these areas. And, but for those of you that aren't familiar with this, sort of the basic idea is that we're going to have an AI agent or an AI algorithm um, that is making decisions, and that those decisions affect the state of the world. This could be a robot that's trying to grasp something, this could be a tutor that's trying to teach someone something, um, and that when it affects the state of the world, um, that we're now going to get back new observations and maybe a reward signal about how good those decisions were. And I think a critical question when we start to think about understanding AI systems is how good are these algorithms? How good are these agents um, in terms of some measure of their performance? And of course, this sounds like you know, a reasonable question. Maybe we can just go deploy it. But I'm really interested in how can we think about their performance before we execute. What sort of formal statements can we make about what is the performance of an AI system before we execute? And I think all of us are very interested in that. And I think that's particularly important in high stakes domains. Um, uh, and again, these may not be life and death situations, things like the stock market or education, but they are places where the decisions matter a lot. Either they are literally about large amounts of money, or they are about affecting someone's ability to learn or affecting a patient's treatment. And so I think that if we can evaluate an AI algorithm in advance of deploying it, then we can do reasonable things like decide what policy we want to deploy and even make decisions about whether or not we want to launch the AI system at all. Well, if we just had nothing else to go on, this might be an incredibly hard problem, but fortunately, we live in the age of big data. And so typically, we have access, even in these sort of human-focused domains, to lots of data whether it's electronic medical record systems or student data, um, we're really starting to have huge amounts of data collected, but normally from using some other algorithm. And when I say some other algorithm, I mean that could be a person, that could be a doctor or a teacher, or it could be some other artificial agent. Um, but typically we have some uh, data that was collected from some other algorithm, and we'd like to use that to say, if we were going to deploy this AI algorithm, how well would this work? Now, for all of you in the audience, many of you have taken machine learning, and this is an easy question if the system itself doesn't influence the data that's collected. And I would argue that over the last 10 years, this has really been the largest focus of machine learning. Um, if you look at supervised machine learning, building things like image classifiers, my classifier to decide whether or not this image is a dog doesn't affect whether this image is a dog. It doesn't affect whether or not the next image I get is a dog or not. It's just trying to classify. And so this makes the problem much, much simpler um, because our algorithm is not actually making decisions in the world that affect the state of the world or affect the data we get. But in reinforcement learning, um, and then things like robotics and tutors and medical treatment, um, and all the examples that uh, Claire and Tom were just giving, that's exactly the issue that we have. That the decisions we make crucially influence the data that we get back. And so if we have old data, that old data is from a different distribution. And so that starts to raise some really important statistical um, and technical questions. 
And so what we'd really like to be able to do, again, is to sort of have some uh, policy and some data collection from some other, uh, some other policy, and yet still be able to get good, in some formal way, estimates of how well this policy would be before actually deploying it. So one way you could think about doing this is to build a model. And we've heard a lot about models even in this uh, panel so far. And so this is sort of my rough characterization of how that would work. We choose a model form. We take the data that was collected using some other policy. We'd use it to estimate the model parameters. And then we could simulate our desired policy. So just to be clear here, a model form in this case is perhaps some parametric model or non-parametric model. It could be a Gaussian process. It could be a deep neural net. There's some sort of structural form um, of a model. And then it's a model that needs to be trained with data. So it has some parameters that describe how the model works. And so that's what we can use our data to estimate. And then we can simulate any policy we like. Why is this tricky? Well, this is tricky for several reasons. Um, one is sort of the issues that we're already discussing this panel so far, which is to say, um, if you don't have much data, then the model parameters you estimate may be wrong. That's certainly one big issue. But the other big issue is that our model form itself may be radically wrong. So this is very tempting, at least in the case of education, because people are really hard to model. And so often we end up with very, very simplified models. For example, for those of you that are familiar with hidden Markov models, we typically use a two-state hidden Markov model, model student learning. I like to personally believe I'm more complex than that. Um, so all models are wrong, but some are useful. So this is the issue, is that when we take this sort of approach, um, if we use this to estimate the performance of a policy, then often if the model form is wrong, then we're going to get a biased estimate. Um, it's going to be low variance, which is great, because we're going to maybe have a very precise wrong estimate. But um, it's still biased. And so this can be a problem if we're trying to use this to decide on medical tre treatment policies. So here's another extreme. Another extreme is known as important sampling estimation. Um, and the idea in this case is to take our data collected from the other policy and not use any model at all, and directly kind of try to reweight that data to make it look as if it was from the distribution of data you'd get if you were to follow the policy you really care about. And essentially, it's just sort of upweighting the data that looks more like the policy um, that you want to deploy and less like the policy that you actually collected it under. This is a very elegant idea. It's been used in statistics extensively. Um, people like Doina Precup have been using it in the context of reinforcement learning for over a decade. The great thing about this is that if you have a lot of data, um, it's an unbiased estimator. It will converge to the right answer. Um, but the variance can be enormous. And the variance can be so high that your estimator is nonsensical. It doesn't give you any information about whether or not you should deploy this policy. So we've got one thing with potentially high bias and low variance, the other one with no bias and high variance. Let's combine them. So this is an idea that's been, uh, this idea of doubly robust estimation has been present in statistics for a while. Um, and it has been introduced by some of my colleagues for the reinforcement learning and control setting recently in a way that still creates sort of a no bias estimator but has some variance. And so what uh, my postdoc Phil Thomas and I recently have shown is that if you look at what we really care about, which is getting really accurate estimates of how a policy would work before we deploy it, we might be willing to have a little bit of bias if we can greatly reduce the variance. And so we've shown that you can sort of directly try to combine these in a new way in order to minimize mean squared error. Try to just get really good estimates of how well a policy would work before you deploy it. And so it turns out you can do this in a way that is still strongly consistent. If you have enough data, we will give you a good estimate of the resulting policy. But it can be have orders of magnitude tighter estimates of mean squared error. Now, we've looked at this in simulation so far. But the real sort of cases that we're interested in is doing this for high stakes domains. And so we're starting to look at it in the context of medical treatment tools and diabetes. All right, so I just talked about how we could do kind of what I call policy evaluation. Before you deploy a policy, you've got some old data. How well is that policy going to work? But to me, and I think many of us in the audience, one of the most exciting aspects about AI and machine learning is the learning. So here I've put sort of inside of our little AI box that it has some fixed policy. It has some fixed rule that says, when I have this observation, this is the decision I'm going to make. But in reality, we normally have AI systems that are learning, that are changing their policies actively when they get new data. And they might even be changing their models, just as what Claire was talking about. And what we would like to do is to be able to reason about how these systems are going to work. How are our learning systems going to work when we deploy them before we deploy them? 
So we want to move from the situation where we're thinking about having some fixed but potentially adaptive policy to thinking about having some algorithm and some data collected from another algorithm and using that to figure out how well would that algorithm work before we deploy it. And again, this is important because this is going to allow us to make decisions among which type of algorithms do we want to choose to deploy and whether we are satisfied with the performance of any of those algorithms. So we'd like to be able to create sort of offline evaluators of algorithms. And there's a lot of different desirable properties we might like in these situations. We might like them to be unbiased. We might like them to be data efficient, not leave too much data for us to get a good estimate of how well the algorithm would work. And we might like it so that we don't need to know very much about how the previous data was gathered. And this is particularly important in the case of the situations I look at, like education and healthcare, because often we don't have someone writing down that their policy for how they're treating someone is, you know, X equals goes to Y. We don't necessarily have a complete structural written down formal description of the algorithm for how our data was collected. So we've been thinking about this in the context of education. This is Tree Frog Treasure. It's um, a game for uh, teaching students fractions. Turns out that if you don't understand fractions, it's incredibly hard to understand algebra. And unfortunately, in America, many, many students don't understand fractions. So this game has been played by, I think, around 100,000 students. And we were interested in figuring out what levels should we present when to the student and how we should sort of featureize this game to enhance learning and engagement. And to do this before we deploy it because as many of you may have experienced or have noticed, if you lose a, a customer or a learner early on, they may never come back and it is entirely voluntary. So we wanted to use this sort of offline evaluator to figure out which algorithms to deploy in the future. And essentially we found that we considered a number of different ways to do offline algorithm evaluation, um, but this plot just suggests that we can do much, much better mean squared error estimates of an algorithm's performance by using our type of approaches compared to if we only have access to an approximate model that might not be very good. So just to summarize, I think that one really critical issue is thinking about how well we can evaluate how good an AI system or an AI algorithm will be before we deploy it. And I think we need to think about this both for when those are static policies, but also particularly when they're learning. Um, I think that some of the issues that Claire and Tom were raising are incredibly exciting about how can we have bounds on online exploration? What does it mean to do safe exploration and how much do we lose in terms of performance? And then just one other <coughs> thing I want to mention again is that I feel like safety and control right now is preventing sort of the benefit of AI from reaching the masses that it could. Because I think many people are concerned by what it means for an algorithm to be adaptive and how it will behave. And so we need to both be able to give bounds on performance and also to make it performance interpretable in order for it to reach the benefit it could. Thanks.